Hi, I'm Mitchell German. I'm the author of Your Storytelling Potential, the underground guide to finally writing a great screenplay or novel. This, um, this work, the information I share in this book, it's the culmination of literally decades of my own analysis and, and thinking about and trying to understand what makes certain stories, certain movies, certain screenplays, certain writers, certain filmmakers so ultra unbelievably successful where the other 99% of struggling writers and authors and novelists just can't seem to put together a really well thought out story and really understand one of the foundational ideas that I teach in this, in this book, I'd like to share something about the movie E.T. Now, if you're not familiar with the movie E.T., E.T. is, uh, it was directed by a guy named Steven Spielberg. It was released in the early 80s, 81, 1981, 1982. At the time of its release, it became the number one all-time highest grossing film. I believe it was the first one to go over a billion dollars. It surpassed another movie you've probably heard about, and that was the original Star Wars Episode IV. So I'd like to talk to you about this movie because it was extraordinarily successful, but there's something, a profound idea, again, that I teach it in my book that we can learn just by looking carefully at the movie E.T. Now, E.T., if you're not familiar with the movie, I'll just assume some people who are watching this video are not. It's about the alien named E.T. who is accidentally left behind on Earth. So his spaceship and his, his, uh, his all the other aliens, they're, they've landed on Earth. This is how the movie starts, the opening sequence. And they're, they're wandering around in the woods collecting specimens of plants and whatnot. And what happens is there's some NASA guys and some government-like officials who, who realize and are aware that this spaceship has landed there and they're coming up into the mountain area in the woods to investigate what's going on. And then E.T., because of this, gets trapped. And he gets left behind and he can't get back to the spaceship and the spaceship has to leave him behind. Now what happens is E.T. runs off. And now this sets the stage for E.T. is left behind on, 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 on Earth. But these NASA guys, these, these uh, government guys, they know that there's an alien left behind. Now what happens then is E.T. wanders into the main character's, the main character's um, backyard. That's Elliot. Now what's really, really important is to understand E.T. is not the main character. Elliot is the main character. So this boy just happens to be living near the woods where E.T. Um, gets left behind, his house backs up to the woods, and then E.T. wanders into his backyard. Now, what's interesting is there are really two major stories taking place here. You've got E.T., you've got the government guys and, and the, these NASA-like officials. That's one part. It's literally one half of the movie. There's no relationship between E.T. and Elliot when the movie starts. And then you've got Elliot and his whole life and everything going on. And there are literally two unrelated storylines taking place in parallel as the movie begins. We've got Elliot and his his life going on, and, we, and if you're familiar with the movie, if you're not familiar with the movie, it starts with Elliot and his brothers, and they're playing this old game called Dungeons and Dragons at the time, it was very popular, and he goes and gets pizza, and then when the pizza gets delivered, that's how he bumps initially into E.T., who's wandered into his backyard. But, and then you got E.T. and everything going on with E.T. that he's been left behind, and the NASA guys. Now what's really important to understand, and this is what the, the idea I want to express, is that the, one half of the movie is E.T. and the NASA guys. This guy, his name is Keyes. He's a character in the movie. He becomes a very important character as the movie gets in towards the climax near the end. But you've got E.T. and the NASA guys. That's literally one part of the story, and it's its own entire storyline unrelated to Elliot and his family. So it's two things. It's E.T. and the NASA guys, and E.T. getting left behind. Elliot and his family. Unrelated. These are unrelated to each other. When the movie begins, these are two distinct storylines that are going to converge. And this is one of the most foundational, important concepts that, again, I teach in my book, which is that great stories is the convergence of these are two major, it's the intersection or convergence of two major independent stories. The, the storyline, I guess, of E.T. E. story, which he brings keys with him, and then Elliot's story, and he brings his sister, his brother, his mother, but what's really interesting to think about, and this is what's so essential, is what happens, what would have happened if E.T. didn't wander into Elliot's backyard? I want to be really clear here. Elliot is the main character. There's absolutely no question. The main character of the film, of the movie, of the story, what is traditionally called the protagonist, it's, that is Elliot, for sure. But I'm asking a different question. What would have happened if E.T. had wandered into somebody else's backyard? This is, this is the one of the most profound, important questions and, and ideas that really distinguish the truly great, astronomically amazing stories from everything else. Because you see, had E.T. wandered into, let's say, the old couple next door, living next door to Elliot, instead of Elliot's backyard, they wandered into this couple. Well, guess what would have happened? 
Elliot wouldn't be in the story. And his mother and his brother and his sister wouldn't be in the story. Instead, the old couple would be in the story. Maybe their grandchildren would be in the story. And their grandchildren would develop their relationship with E.T. And their grandchildren would, would, would be the one dealing with, uh, with keys. And their grandchildren would be the one get, helping E.T. get home. Or maybe E.T. would have wandered into this fraternity house backyard, right across the street down the road, the fraternity house. What would have happened then? Well, the, grand, grand, the, 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 the older couple, they'd be gone. Elliot and his family would be gone. Instead, we'd have some frat guys. It would be a really funny comedy beer drinking, partying, E.T. And then as the story flows, the, the, the NASA guys get involved and then the, you know, some, of the, the, some of the frat guys realize this is serious. We've got to help this, this alien that we become friends with and, and we give him the frat pin and all that stuff. Get him back home. What we see is that the main character is interchangeable. The main character could be changed. No matter which main character we choose, whether it was E.T., I mean, whether it was Elliot, or the old couple, or the fraternity house. Well, guess what? E.T., no matter what, E.T. is definitely still in the story. And guess who's also still in the story? Keys and the NASA guys. They are also still definitely in the story. It's the main character who can be interchangeable in terms of the story. Because E.T. is the concept that I'm going to be explaining. E.T. is the one causing the story to happen, not the main character. It's a major, enormous fallacy. The main character does not cause stories to happen. Another character type, which I'm going to explain in this video, causes stories to happen. Think about it this way. Would Steven Spielberg have made a story about Elliot and his sister and his mother and his brother and his brother's friends? Is this, is this the story that Steven Spielberg would have made a movie about? Of course not. No, because what's really essential and what's really important is to understand that E.T. is the one causing the story to happen, not the protagonist, not the main character. And you have to have both. You have to have an E.T.-like character who's causing the story to happen, who's not the protagonist, not the main character, and you have to have a main character that is completely unrelated to what is going on. Again, what, is e what does Elliot and his family have to do with anything with E.T. or the NASA guys or any Nothing. E.T. just happens to wander into his backyard and that is it. You see, part of the problem with the way um, most people have learned storytelling, and this is the problem of all these experts out there teaching really awful, bad information, is that there's an idea of subplots coming into a story. And this specifically, this graph, is one that's very popular in terms of screenwriting. And the way storylines are taught is that you have a major story, right? You've got this big A story, and then you've got a bunch of what they call subplots or B stories. But when you look at a, a graph like this, does, 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 can you, does that how, how E.T. works at all? No. You've got E.T. You've got Elliot's story is one major line. And you've got E.T.'s story, which is also a major line. And then you've got subplots which come off of those major lines. Now, it's also very, uh, very much a problem with this specific image is that notice the way they frame the subplots. They have the subplots got its own structure and then it ends. But here's the climax. Here's the ending. And they've got the subplot. The subplots come to an end. But that's not true. I mean, you think about the Keys character. He's definitely a subplot. 100% subplot. Does, it, does Keys look anything like this? Nothing like this. Keys comes into the movie at the midpoint, so he doesn't come in at the, near the beginning. And then he flows to the end. He's, he's, he's at the end of the, end of the movie. And, and all of, all of his, his mother, his sister, his brother, what are they? They're not, they are part of the major story going on, just like Keys is. But they're all subplots. Every one of those plots is a subplot. Right? And they, all, they don't look like this. They come in at different points, and they flow to the ending, to the climax, even to Friends. I mean, think about E.T. Who's at the ending? Who's at the end when they're back in the woods? E.T.'s getting on the spaceship. Who's there? The mother, the brother, the sister, Keys, the dog, the friends. They're all there. Not one of the major subplots. In the movie, E.T. ends before the climax. They all flow into the ending, into the climax. And that's why one of the um, ways, the proper ways to think about, like, for instance, subplots, and this is something I teach in my book, and I believe the page, this image is on page... Yes, page 193. So here's this image right here. So this image shows that we've got an A story and a B story, and that's A story and B story, right? We've got 
E.T.'s story, and we've got Elliot's story, and then subplots branch off of those storylines. E.T. brings along with his situation that E.T. has subplots. In the, in the case of specifically, we've got the NASA guys and Keys. And off of Elliot's story, we've got subplots. His sister, his brother, his mother, the brother's friends. All flowing. And they don't end before, before the ending. They flow into the ending beyond the ending. And that's a really important idea. Really important idea. What happens at the end flows beyond the end credits of a movie or the last page of a book. It projects into the future that there's more to the story. That these people have been profoundly, all these characters would have been profoundly, profoundly changed. And that change carries through beyond the ending. Now, this is uh, Alan Cram. I have a course I teach. Um, the book actually is based on the course, and it's basically like a master's level course on storytelling. And Alan took my course, and this is what he had to say. Amazing piece of work you've developed. Your worksheets, with the book you get these unbelievable story building worksheets. Your unique method of thinking about the A story and the B story. And how subplots enrich both storylines. I literally have hundreds it's not even an exaggeration to say of hundreds and hundreds of testimonials and feedback, incredible feedback, um, based on my course, my book, my software that I've created for storytellers over the years. It's just endless. But the reason I chose Alan's is he's talking specifically about how storylines enrich both, how subplots, sorry, how subplots enrich both storylines. And the crystalline way of approaching the theme, so again, something you'll learn in my book is how to properly, properly think about thematic relevance and thematic depth and theme in your stories, it's all in this book, right, is the most helpful advice I've ever received. And um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, again, I'm Mitchell German. I am the author of Your Story and Potential, and I'm also the CEO and founder here at Creative Writer Software, um, creator of software such as Plot Control for writing, um, amazing, deep, thematically relevant movies, specifically screenplays, chapter control for doing the same thing with novels, and then for developing and de producing incredibly well thought out and developed and rich um, TV shows and is my software episode control. So it's plot control, chapter control, and episode control. Now before I go on and tell you about my book, in case you think E.T. is some extraordinary example, I can assure you the patterns I've been talking about and sharing with you, they're found in the most successful movies. Take, for example, the movie Die Hard, another classic, successful movie um, with Bruce Willis. Now, when it comes to Die Hard, why is Bruce Willis in the building? You have to think about this for a second. He's in the building to visit his wife. That's why he's there. What does Bruce Willis have to do with, with the, the building? Nothing. The Nakatomi building, right? He's not a part of that. The company, nothing. The, he has nothing to do with anything. He's simply there on Christmas Eve visiting his wife and family. In fact, he's literally just arrived from the airport when Hans Gruber and his group of terrorists and thieves take over the building and take everyone hostage. Again, who's causing the story? Is Bruce Willis causing the story? Does Bruce Willis hear about, oh my gosh, the uh, terrorists have taken over the Nakatomi building, let me run in there and you know, save the day? Is that how the story unfolds? No. Hans Gruber, Hans Gruber is, is, has been planning, been planning this takeover and robbery of the Nakatomi building for, for all we know for years, or year, months. We don't know how long. We don't even know how much time has been put into this. We only see when he's executing his plan, which he happens to be executing his plan at the very same time that the Bruce Willis character, John McClane, is visiting his wife on Christmas Eve. And Hans Gruber is accounted for every single person in the building, every single, value, va every, every single variable he's accounted for, except for one, the guy who's not supposed to be in the building. Now, what is the cause of the story? Is the cause of the story the Bruce Willis character? Or could have that have been any myriad of characters that we could think of to be visiting a friend, a wife, for any other reason, for some reason, accidentally in the building? The guy who's causing the story, again, is Hans Gruber, not unlike the character E.T. But in case you think it ends with something like that, how about the movie Star Wars? Because the truth about great storytelling, it's been staring at us our entire lives, literally looking, we've all grown up with Star Wars. And we just don't pay attention to the most basic story construct because it's staring at us, the truth about great storytelling, it's staring at us right in our faces. What is the original movie Star Wars about? I can tell you right now, it's not about Luke Skywalker. 
fundamentally, what's causing the story to happen? When I say about what's causing the story to happen, does Luke Skywalker cause the story to happen? No. Darth Vader is chasing the rebellion and Leia. Now Leia has stolen, the rebellion has stolen these plans of the Death Star, right? And Darth Vader is, the movie starts, they, they blast open the door and there's a huge fight. And what happens then is Leia, Luke has nothing to do with that. Luke doesn't even know what's happening, right? Leia then takes those plans and puts them on R2-D2 and sends it down to the planet that's, that's below wherever they are. And, and then Darth Vader is going to go after that, those droids to try and stop those plans. Now, what's interesting about Leia sending those plans to, to this planet where Luke happens to live, are the plans intended for Luke? No. They're not even intended for Luke. The plans are intended for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luke has nothing to do with the story, except that he accidentally, accidentally, you keep hearing that word? E.T. accidentally wanders into Elliot's backyard. Bruce Willis happens to be accidentally in the Nakatomi building when Hans Gruber and his group um, raid the building and take all the hostages. Luke Skywalker accidentally ends up with R2-D2. Got to hear what's going on here. Because the story is not about, about Luke. Luke ends up tangled up in the story, for sure. Bruce Willis ends up tangled up in the story, for sure. Elliot ends up tangled up in the story, for sure. But it's not about them. It's about Darth Vader and Leia and those plans. You see, and then the other thing about Star Wars, which is amazing, Obi-Wan has no idea what's going on. Just as clueless. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know even what the plans are about. But he's going to find out because they're going to take those plans and try and get him back to the rebellion. How about the classic movie Rocky? Now, this movie launched the career of Steve, um, uh, of uh, Cy, of uh, Sylvester Stallone, and and he won an Academy Award. This movie won an Academy Award. Now, what's amazing about this movie is that it's about this guy, the Sylvester Stallone, the Rocky character, the Italian Stallion. So the Italian Stallion gets a chance to fight Apollo Creed for the world belt. That's what the movie's about. This down and out loser, nobody boxer gets a chance to get it to fight the, 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 for the belt for the world champion, and he almost wins. But who causes the story to happen? Does the character Rocky say, "Hey, Italian Stallion," I mean, "Hey, Apollo Creed, you're the best boxer in the world. I want to fight you for the belt." No. What happens is Apollo Creed's um, uh, the person he's supposed to fight breaks his hand, and he needs a new opponent. And he decides to turn the whole match into a gimmick by giving a nobody a shot. So who causes the story to happen? The main character? <laughs> Rocky is, no one's going to argue that Rocky is the main character. No one's going to argue that. Luke is the main character. No one's going to argue, argue that. Bruce Willis is the main character. Does the main character, the Italian stallion, cause the story to happen? Mm, no. Apollo Creed causes the story to happen. And it's just an accidental choice, if you will. A, a, an arbitrary choice, in this case that Apollo Creed chooses the Italian Stallion, and he call, and chooses it because of his name, the Italian Stallion. That's literally why he chooses him. How about the movie Armageddon, another Bruce Willis story? Is the, the Bruce Willis character cause have anything to do with what's going on? You see, you've got this massive asteroid that's headed towards the Earth, and you've got the Billy Bob Thornton character, his name's Dan Truman in the movie, who runs NASA and has got to figure out how to stop the asteroid. What does any of this have, have to do with the main character? Nothing. Nothing. And I'm going to repeat myself because it's so important. What does Elliot have to do with E.T.? Nothing. What does the Bruce Willis character have to do with Hans Gruber? Nothing. What does Luke Skywalker, in terms of the situation, of course, the, the, Luke is Darth Vader's son, which we find out later, and his Leia sister, we find out later, but in terms of the situation that's taking place in that first movie that George Lucas made, what does Luke Skywalker have to do with what's going on? Nothing. What does he have to do with what's going on? Nothing. How about Home Alone? What does the Macaulay Culkin character who gets left Home Alone have to do with the, uh, the Wet Bandits? Um, Daniel Stern and Joe Pesci. What, these, two, these two characters are going to rob the house, and who's not supposed to be there? He's, he gets left Home Alone, nothing to do with them, and they don't even know he's there. And because they don't know, know he's there, the whole movie unfolds. All the comedy comes out of the fact that they're going to rob the house and he's not supposed to be there. He's there by accident. And then there's Back to the Future. What's crazy about Back to the Future is the main character, Marty, he doesn't even know about the existence of the time machine. You have to let this sink in. 
Go watch the movie again. You're roughly 25 minutes into the movie. The character Marty doesn't know what's going on. Doc, the, uh, the, the uh, Doc Brown character says, meet me at the mall in the parking lot. And then he finds out that there's a time machine. He doesn't know about the time machine. And then the terrorists show up, they kill Doc Brown, and in trying to get away from the, the terrorists, he's driving around in the DeLorean, hits 88 miles per hour, and then is accidentally sent to the past. Five minutes earlier, he didn't know there was a time machine, and then he's sent to the past. All by accident. You see, there's a, an idea that's very prevalent, it's sort of like a rule of storytelling that you will not read about in my book. In fact, you're gonna learn that it is completely wrong, and it's wrong thinking, it's the wrong way to think about stories, and that is the idea that a protagonist must drive a story. If you've spent any amount of time studying storytelling, you've come across some expert out there teaching this idea, a protagonist drives a story. Yet what we see in all these examples, classic examples, some of the most successful stories in movies, is that that's not true. Not in one of these storylines, is a protagonist driving a story. And if we were to dig into what happens after the situation and the main character converge, we'll still see that they're not driving the story so much. It's a fallacy. It's not true. And we can see this really clearly in the story Back to the Future. Because in the Back to the Future, again, Marty, the Marty character, not only does he not know what's going on, he doesn't even know there is a time machine. The whole movie is about getting back to the future. And then, when he, then how does he end up in the past? By accident completely. It's just, he's not intending to go to the past. None of, the, none of these stories are intentional. Doc Brown has created the time machine. Doc Brown is the one who's gonna travel through time. And again, it's all by accident that Marty ends up in the past. There's no, he's not driving the story at all. So if in a classic movie like Back to the Future, clearly the main character's not driving the story. That's why in my book, this idea of the protagonist, it's a term you will not read about. We call the main character the main character because the idea that they're a protagonist is um, suggestive that they're somehow driving the story. And that is completely wrong. It's not the right way to think about your main character because the main characters in the greatest stories do not drive the story. So if the main character does not drive the story, that raises a really difficult and important question. Well, it's not the main character, the protagonist driving the story, then who drives the story? Now, if you're ahead of me, you're probably thinking, well, if it's not the protagonist, then obviously it's the antagonist. The antagonist would obviously drive a story if it's not the main, main, if it's not the main character, it's obviously the antagonist. Except there's one problem. Actually, lots of problems. But here are a few examples. There's a, what, we got 10 examples of the problem. The Descendants, the movie Descendants, does not have an antagonist. Armageddon, we already talked about that one. There's no antagonist. There's a big problem. There's an asteroid that's headed towards the Earth that's got to be stopped. They've got to figure something out, but there's no antagonist. There are antagonizing characters, but I want to stay focused on the goal here. We're asking a fundamental question. Does the, the antagonist drive the story? If the protagonist is not driving the story, in the case of Armageddon, definitely the Bruce Willis character is not driving the story. It's the Billy Bob Thornton character that's driving the story. But if it's not the main character and it's not the, Billy, the antagonist, of who's, the point is there's no, the antagonist is not driving the story. Neither protagonist nor antagonist is driving the story. Neither protagonist nor antagonist is driving the story. Neither and Field of Dreams is interesting because Field of Dreams, he hears a voice, says build a field. So he builds the field, right? Why? Not his own doing. He does it because he has this vision, an idea that he can't get out of his head. Now in Field of Dreams, there's the brother-in-law who is very antagonized. In fact, the, the brother-in-law doesn't want him to build the field. He says, no, you can't build the field. You're going to go bankrupt. You have to stop building the field. So you've got the opposite of an antagonist driving the story. In the case of Field of Dreams, if the character we would call the antagonist, and he's really more of an antagonizing character and not so much the antagonist, but if we were to call him the antagonist, he's literally the antithesis of driving the story. He's saying, stop with the field. Don't build the field. Just plow it, plow it under and grow your crop. <laughs> he's not... He's not He's not driving the story. That's what I want to keep our eye on. He's not driving the story. In Goodwill Hunting, there's no antagonist. Literally no antagonist. Who's the antagonist? The professor? Who's the antagonist? There's no antagonist. French Kiss, no antagonist. Interstellar. So you got the Matt Damon character who comes along near the ending. And again, he's very antagonizing. But is he causing the story? I mean, he's in the movie for like 20 minutes near the ending, before the climax. And then he dies. He's not driving the story. Rocky, again, who's driving the story? Who's creating the story? 
Apollo Creed. Now, Apollo Creed, they agree to the fight. Now, this is really important because what does an antagonist do? An antagonist has an opposite opposing goal to the main character. Now, at the fight, they're both trying to win, but they agree for the majority, until the climax, when the fight happens in Rocky, they agree to the fight. The fight is, is a, they agree. That let's, we're going to have a fight. Great. Now we're going to prepare for the fight. And at the end, in the climax, they're trying to each win the fight. But that, that's not, he's certainly, he's not, He's not the antagonist the way we're, he's not like Darth Vader antagonist. Sideways? There's no antagonist in sideways. And this is where you gotta be really careful because there is a expert who teaches at a major university in California, screenwriting specifically. It's probably a master's program. And this expert who's got a very popular book on screenwriting teaches that there is a, an antagonist in sideways. And he says, it's the ex-wife. Now, it's so absurd because the ex-wife is literally not in the movie. She shows up in the movie for, again, two minutes at the ending, and she's on a couple telephone calls with him. And this is where there's an idea so critically important that you're going to learn in my book that I'm going to teach you right now about character types, the proper way to think about E.T. and Darth Vader and the, Dan, uh, the, the, the Billy Bob Thornton character and all these different characters, and the proper way to think about the ex-wife because there's no antagonist in sideways. Yet this professor teaches that there has to be an antagonist in every movie. And that's not true. He's taking the proverbial round peg and bashing it into the square hole like a kindergartner would do. Because he says, his book says, hey, you have to have an antagonist. Well, where's the antagonist in sideways? There is none. Well, let's make one up. Let's just make pull some characters barely in the movie out of thin air. And he's completely wrong. And then there's Back to the Future. And Back to the Future is amazing because everyone would agree there's an antagonist, and that's Biff. Everyone agrees that Biff is an antagonist, but here's the problem with Biff. We already spoke about Marty. Marty's not driving the story. Marty's sent to 1955 completely by accident because of the actions of Doc Brown, because Doc Brown gets killed, because he's trying to get away from the terrorists. But you know what's crazy about Biff? He, the Biff in 1955, the Biff in the, in, the, in, the, in the present day has nothing to do with anything. In 1955, Biff doesn't ever find out that Marty's from the, in the first one, that he's from the future. He never finds out that there's a time machine. He never finds out that Marty's trying to get back to the future. He has absolutely nothing to do with any of those storylines. He knows nothing about anything. So this leaves us with a really difficult question. If in one of the most successful movies, one of the most successful franchises, story franchises, made by some of the greatest filmmakers, Steven Spielberg was involved in this, Robert Zemeckis. You know, th this movie is th among the most successful classic movies. And we have a situation where not the protagonist and not the antagonist, neither are driving the story. Neither one. So that raises a really problematic question, an important question. If it's not the protagonist and not the antagonist, well then who drives the story? Who drives the story? Who drives the story in Back to the Future? Well, this is why in my book, you will learn about three major character types. I teach that there is a proximate cause character, a main character, and a character called the underlying cause character. Now the proximate cause character is what I've been discussing with you today. The proximate cause character is the one who causes the story to happen. E.T. is the proximate cause character. Hans Gruber is the proximate cause character. Apollo Creed is the proximate cause character. And the main character is interchangeable. The main character could be anyone. That's not true, it's not a true statement. Because we talk, we talk about, again in the book, we talk about the uniquely extraordinary main character. But the point I'm trying to make here is the main character is not the one causing the story. The proximate cause character is the ultimately the one who's the truly essential character. E.T. can't be E.T. without E.T. E.T. can be a story, a substantial story, without Elliot and Elliot's family, it would just be some other people. This is the idea that I've been talking about, that there is an A story, that's E.T. story, and we call that character the proximate cause character. And then there's a B story, the underlying cause character. And I haven't been so much addressing the issue of the underlying, ca underlying cause character, but E.T.'s, um, I'm sorry, Elliot's a family, and everything going on in Elliot's life would be what we'd call the underlying cause character. And then you've got the main character who's stuck in the middle, who gets tangled up in what's going on in other people's stories. In the case of Back to the Future, whose story is it really? It's Doc Brown's story. Doc Brown is the one who created the time machine. Doc Brown is the one who tends to travel through time. 
The Marty character just happens to get accidentally tangled up in what Doc Brown is up to. Doc Brown is what we call the proximate cause character causing, creating that A story, the major story that the story can't be without is the Doc Brown storyline. And then there is what we call the underlying cause character. In the case of Back to the Future, that is Biff. And Biff is, the whole idea of the underlying cause character and the character Biff specifically is beyond the scope of this video, but you will definitely learn about it with my book. Biff, the whole reason the story has to take place in 1955 is because Biff as the underlying cause character bullies around Marty's father in 1955. That's the essential year that certain events are gonna put in, into play motions that are gonna have a massive impact in the future of the story which ends up being the now of the Marty character's life. But the underlying cause character in the case of Back to the Future is Biff. This is Blake Thomas who also took my course, Your Storytelling Potential. Of course he has my book. This is what he had to say. Just finished listening to live session 16. I loved it. I loved all of it. Your discussion of the cause to a cause for both the A and B stories is terrific. But what I really loved was what you had to say about, you know, my pen, about the proximate cause character and the underlying cause character. These are unique concepts that you will not learn about anywhere else. What you're gonna learn about these ideas are absolutely 100% unique to my way of thinking about stories. And of course, that's until everybody starts stealing from me like they have all, over the last 10 years, 10 decades, people, experts have stolen so much of my way of thinking about stories that um, is found in my, in my software and my other courses that I've done. But um, he's talking about here, the proximate cause character, the underlying cause character, because it lets you think about stories totally, completely differently. Thanks again for your remarkable seminar. You see, what's gonna happen when you look at my book, and when you, if you maybe take my course, is that once you have a fundamental understanding of great storytelling, which is what you're gonna get as you go through this, you will then have the potential to write great screenplays and to write great novels and to put together incredible stories and anything else. And that's what this book is about. This book, it's about exploring and, and, and revealing the, the deepest, most amazing secrets about storytelling that are right there, except the insights have literally taken me over a decade, maybe two decades to figure out and really connect all the dots about what's really, truly going on in great storytelling and no one else is teaching what you will learn in this book. Now, the concepts of the book starts with this, what I call the complete story reveal. This is really what's going on in a complete story. And there are three major parts, an A story, a B story. There's a thematic layer, which we didn't talk about at all in, in, in this uh, video, but the thematic layer is the glue, if you will, that literally holds the whole story together. You got a main character, you got multiple problems or opportunities, and then you've got what we call primary situation, a personal goal, underlying cause. All this converges to become what is a great story. And this is really what the whole book is about. It starts with an exploration of this image and then it expands this into everything. So this is what we call the, the character wave because when you talk about traditional structure, they just have a single line in the events an inciting incident and plot points and a midpoint and, and act one, two, and three. It's not sufficient to really truly understand what's happening in great stories. Rather, we have an A story and the events taking place within that A story. We have a B story and the events taking place within that B story and they converge to create what we call a character wave and real structure happens here in the middle. Real structure. And when you do this, all the structure just falls in place. Inciting incidences and, and uh, uh, plot points and midpoint, everything comes together when you get the events of the A story and the events of the B story done correctly. And then of course you have the subplots, you have a major A story taking place, a major B story, and then break off plots that become subplots. And then this book and my system, we break it down, everything. This is, this is act two, and we literally break down, for instance, all the acts like this. But here's act two and all the details of every single event that needs to be taking place within act two. We do this for act one and act three as well. And then we get structure down to what I call the simple story timeline, and we understand that there's an A-B parallel structure taking place. There is an A story, and there is a B story. They're both taking place, and both storylines have complete structure. Not just one line, it's two major lines with a complete structural system taking place. And then there's what I call the core elements. The core elements form the foundation, the roots, if you will, of all great stories. These 12 core elements allow a writer, a storyteller, a filmmaker to think about what is happening. You see, we're so 
we, we're so in, in, ingrained in this idea of thinking about our stories in terms of structure. And this is my structure, but this is structure, right? When certain things need to happen, when certain things within the A story need to happen, when certain things within the B story need to happen. But that doesn't speak to what happens. So rather than thinking about when things happen, in my system, we think about what happens. Before we think about and worry about when, this is out of order. This is done way before this. What things happen is the first thing we think about. What are characters trying to do, irrespective of when they're going to happen, when these things happen. You take this. This is actually a worksheet you get with the book. You get printable, downloadable. You can fill these worksheets in. And you fill this in with the information you learn from the book to understand what each one of these boxes are, become. And then this becomes this. This, this literally becomes from here to here. What happens here? The primary situation, all, all the different things, the discoveries taking place over, oops, went the wrong way. Discoveries taking place over here, right? This is when this happens. This is what lets you think about what happens. What is the key discovery? What is the key piece of information that unlocks the climax? And then there's worksheets for literally structure. This is what we call AB parallel structure. And again, there's the simple story timeline. Then there's structure for every subplot. You have to go through the exercise of thinking about every single subplot. And what is the structure? Not three little bumps. That's not the structure of subplots. This is the structure of subplots. Every subplot, you go through this exercise, and it's amazing. And that's my book, Your Storytelling Potential. So this book is available um, now. Um, and again, it's like a master's course. So it's this, the book itself was written based on my course called Your Storytelling Potential. And um, it's basically like a master's course. I mean, you could have this as a really dense, thorough, comprehensive textbook on storytelling, on screenwriting, on story building, on novel writing, and a master's level, master's degree course 